everybody. I'm Annie. I'm an addict. Hey. None from all hundred breaths. Y'all, y'all sure know how to throw a convention. I'm gonna get a lot of guff when I come back talking like this. <laughs> anyway, let's get to business here. There's this woman that came into my life in Omaha. over 20 years ago. And I didn't like her not know not one bit. <laughs> she came from a, another city and we had about the same clean time and that's pretty threatening to me. And uh, once I jumped off my high horse, I realized that she had a lot to offer me. And so here's how this went. I said, Tammy, I said, will you sponsor me? And she had heard some of my story, and I buried a sponsor at four years, and I buried a sponsor at 16 years. And she said, sure, but could you call me something else? <laughs> so I called her my spiritual mentor for a while, because I didn't want to lose her, and she sure wasn't ready to go. She has been... my sponsor, and my mom, and my sister, and my baby's grand sponsor, and my children's mom, and my grandbaby's grandma. And, uh, and we've done tons of service together. And uh, you know she gets paid the big bucks because she's sponsoring me, okay? <laughs> she, she'll tell you, she gets paid the big bucks for sponsoring me. <laughs> Anyway, I love her with all of my heart, all of my heart, and admire and adore her. And she has a message to give us tonight, so please be respectful and help me give it up for Tammy B. ago I had my knee replaced. Don't do it. <laughs> Hang on to those fucking knees as long as you can. <laughs> this was not what I had in mind. You know? I was like, ooh, new knee, fun. Not so much. Um, I want to thank the Georgia Regional Convention Committee. This has been the most fun ever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Nobody knows Southern hospitality till they get here. Amen. So I want to tell you a story. So um, I have been talking to John and, uh, or excuse me, not John, Robert. I've been talking to Robert, and he's called, we're talking back and forth, and Robert calls me, and I call Robert, and Robert calls me, and, you know, can we get banquet tickets, and la, 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 la. And then I'm on the way to this little city where I'm gonna watch these boats on, on the water for Christmas, and, and Robert calls me, and he's like, we've had this, this thing going on, and, and so, um, I don't know if I told you when you were speaking, but um, you're the main speaker, and I went, Huh. <laughs> and I says, don't you know how you do this? This is not how you do this. I says, it's that story, you know, where the guy goes on vacation and his buddy comes over to watch his cat and he lives next to his grandma, you know, and he says, he says, so, you know, the, the calls his buddy after he leaves on vacation, he says, what's going on with my cat? And he says, cat died. But he says, that's not how you tell this story. I called you the first day, you said the cat doesn't look very good. I call you the second day and you say the cat had to go to the vet. Third day, the cat's dead. At least we've worked up to it, right? <laughs> At least we've worked up to it. Buddy says, so, so Buddy says, okay, I got this. I'm really sorry. He says, by the way, how's my grandma? And he says, you're taking me for a good. So here I am. 
you know, I had said to my home group, you know, actually they had asked me to be the Sunday speaker, and I went to my home group and I said to my home group, I said, I got this dilemma because if you've met me this weekend, you know, we'll just talk. We're just gonna talk in our native language. So I went to my home group and I said, how many times can you say motherfucker it, before it does not spiritual? <laughs> and the guy in the back of the room went, 37. <laughs> so if you want to count, that was 37. We're down to 36. Keep going. <laughs> I am so pleased to be here. I am so so it is such a privilege to come and talk to you guys, and this is not something I do every day. You know, there's a um, there's a place in your recovery when you think to yourself, you know, okay, my time is gone. You know, I've, I've been all that. I've had a sh you know a boatload of sponsees, and I've done all of these things. You know, and 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 your time kind of comes and goes, and uh, and so the deal for me was maybe my time has come and gone. And uh, I was uh, uh, privileged to be able to be the, uh, the opening speaker at Frick in the last year. And this guy from here, and I don't know who it is, came up to me and said, oh, would you, would you submit your, you know, your CD? Would you submit your CD in? And, and I got a bunch of text messages from whoever it is. And the reason I don't know whoever it is is because they were on text messages on my phone that I decided it was really a good idea to drive over in my driveway. Oh. And I lost everything. So finally, I, I submitted, you know, just out of whatever, I submitted my CD. And then I get this, this uh, text message. From, from this guy, and he's like, oh, I hope you're having a nice day. By the way, we want you to speak. And goodbye. And I'm like, shit. You know, so, you, you know, this has been kind of an unusual situation. So that's how I got here. Let's do a little math so we can get this out of the way. First of all, my birthday is 10-30-1952. I'll be quiet while you do the math. <laughs> And I got clean on 11 11 1985. And so, how do you get that many years you don't use and you don't fucking die? You know, that's how you do that, you know? And you keep coming back. So, I want, I, you know, you guys, have, I've introduced myself to you. Could you guys introduce yourself to me? Can you just like do one, two, three? My name is? Teresa. Thank you so much. Hi, honey. I love you. <laughs> um, you know, the, on a, on, a, on a more serious note, I want us to take a moment. You know, the, George is talking about that six years ago you guys were here. And for a second, let's be in this moment because we're never going to be here again. We will never have this moment in time again. When we come back here, we won't all be here. And so, being in the moment, being in this place where our hearts are, where our enthusiasm is, where we have grown to know each other, where we have heard a message, that life-saving message of recovery, that's now, that's this moment. Don't let it go because this is where it's at. You know, this is where we come together and and we find ourselves, and we find why we're here. Why are we here? You know, uh, we were at the, um, at the meeting earlier today, and they did a clean time countdown, and there was a guy here with one day. Are you here? Guy with one day. One day guy. No one day guy? I mean, he could have been in a treatment center. Anybody here got two days, three days? The 
only reason we are here, because it's about carrying the message. Um, so this has been an interesting year for me. This has been kind of a topsy-turvy year for me. Um, a year of really awesome things that have happened and a, and a year of, of what the hell did, that just happened, happened. And so we're going to start with the ones that were really hard for me. Um, in uh, June, I got a phone call from a guy in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, out of the clear blue, he calls me and he says, do you have any idea where Carrie would be? Now, I was in a relationship with Carrie for 13 years. And we're not in a relationship anymore. We hadn't been in a relationship for a really long time. And it was really surprising to me why they would call me and say, do you have any idea where Carrie would be? And I'm like, I really don't know. I, I mean, I really don't have any ideas. Mom is in a, is in a nursing home, and, 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 and I don't have any idea. But it, they, nobody heard from them for a couple of days. And so through the day, I continued to get call and phone calls from this and then from that one, you know. And, and I'm in Florida, you know. I'm not in Omaha, Nebraska. And, I'm, and finally that night, I got a call from um, Carrie's sponsee, Barry. And, uh, and Carrie had hung himself in the basement of his house. 33 years clean. And he was clean to it. Now, I was really angry. I was angry with, with, because he was the darling of the fellowship. He really was, he was everybody's favorite. You know, he was the guy you called when you wanted furniture moved. He was the H&I guy. Nobody loved H&I better than Carrie did. He was carrying the message to the prisons, to the jails, his whole recovery. He was schlepping t-shirts anywhere you could schlep an H&I t-shirt, you know. And, um, and we forgot to ask him what was wrong. You know, he came into the meetings and he said, I'm scared because I don't have a job. And we forgot to say, are you okay? You know, because Carrie just always been there. He just always been there. And we didn't say, what can I do? And we didn't say, can we help you? You know, we just figured Kerry would always be there. And he wasn't. And you know what happened was it just rang through the fellowship. And I, and, and I came to the Florida region, and I'm sharing about this. And this woman came up to me, and she took the, the, the anger from me. And she said, you know, here's what he did. He decided to move away. He made a decision that he was done being where he was and he needed to be somewhere else. And you can't be mad at him for making a decision. What I can do is I can ask the next person who comes along, are you okay? Do you need my help? Can I be of assistance? Because it wasn't that he didn't come into the meetings and, and say, I'm in trouble. What we didn't do is we didn't ask, what can I do? And we read it every time, what can I do, <laughs> you know? And so that was a big blow for me. I, I, you know, I, 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 I found myself in all these different emotions about what had happened and how it had affected me. And it really didn't. You know, what it affected was it affected the giant fellowship that he touched. And there's a big loss there. And so when we go to make decisions that are permanent decisions, you know, let's make decisions that, that let's make decisions whether we reach people out to people, what we do with our lives. You know, it, so, I, uh, I started going about two years ago to a meeting in um, Orlando, um, and it's at, the, uh, it's at the center, which is the LBGTQ uh, hub of Orlando. And uh, I have a, friend, a good friend that went to a meeting there, and he's like, you want to come down here? And I'm like, sure, I'll go down to meetings. I'm good, good with any meeting, you know. And, and I went there, and I, and I found out that I didn't know anything 
about what was going on there. I thought I was pretty knowledgeable about that kind of, you know, about what was going on in the gay community. And I found out I didn't really know anything. And, and, and I didn't, I love the meeting. Don't get, I, I just adore the meeting. It is a raw meeting where everything gets talked about. How many times have you been to a meeting where people are really, really open about the virus, about, about all the things that are included with that, about where they're at and their treatments, and, and that doesn't happen in my home group. Let's get honest, it doesn't happen in my home group, but it happens there. And I got a lot of information, and about six months ago, my granddaughter decided to call me and, and tell me that, that uh, she was coming out. And what a blessing that I had that kind of information from being there and being available for that information. And that I could be that grandma who was absolutely prepared in all ways for that kind of information to come to me. And I could be the woman that I wanted to be there and be for my grandmother, for my granddaughter. And, 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 and it, it's been really hard for her mom, and it's been super easy for me, you know, and that's cool. That was really cool for me. You know, one of the spiritual principles that we have, and we talk about all the time, is courage. We talk about the courage to come in here and stay clean. We talk about the courage to come in here and do the things that we're supposed to do to help each other stay clean. And we talk about the courage to reinvent ourselves. So when my mom was, my, my mom has passed away a long time ago, and the neighborhood that I grew up in, I'm going to tell you, her neighbors didn't like her. She was not a very pleasant woman. And, um, and after my father died, who everybody loved, um, they kind of abandoned my mom. And my mom got ill and ended up moving into a nursing home. And because that's where she wanted to be. She didn't want to leave and come and live with my sister or I. She, she wanted to be in her community. She was, that was just her deal. And so the, the, the nursing staff would call my sister and I. And they would say, we just love your mother. <laughs> What's my mother's name? <laughs> Your mother is so wonderful. She is so helpful to everybody. She is just that woman. Is there, she's so friendly with everybody. I'm like, my mother? <laughs> but you know what happened? And it happens to us here is we get a chance to reinvent ourselves. We get a chance to not be the person that we were, and we get to start over. And I'm going to tell you that if my mother had passed away the day she moved out of, her, the, out of our family home, there had been seven people at her funeral. The whole damn building was full. When she died, there were people in the hallway. There were people <coughs> coming up telling me how much they appreciated my mom. And again, I was like, what's my mother's name? But you know what? She got a chance to reinvent herself. And I want to tell you that happens here every day. And it's never too late to reinvent ourselves. There's a, there's a woman in the, in, in the rooms tonight who has made a decision to reinvent herself. And um, I'm, I'm not going to call her out, but I'm going to tell you that you are, that, that you inspire me to take a point in time in your life when you're going to be somebody that you've always wanted to be. And, and where else do we get to do this? Really, where else do we get to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm going to start over. Let me start over and be somebody different. It's, it's the coolest thing ever. Narcotics Anonymous, coolest thing ever. I'm here. I get to be whoever I want to be today and be somebody that I can really. I'm, I live my best life. Guys, I am living the best life ever. For the last five years, I lived on my boat. We started, we started on this boat up in Bowie's Landing, up in Baltimore. We're, tuk, 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 tuk. we're a sailboat, they don't go very fast. Tuk, 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 tuk. Down, the, down the intercoastal, you know, tuk, 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 tuk. You know, we see Savannah, we see, you know, St. Mary's. St. Mary's has the best boaters Thanksgiving ever, just saying. Um, you know, tuk, 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 tuk. so, so, 
one of the, you know, my whole life, my whole recovery life is about snapshots, and I just want to share some things with you. So I'm in uh, Hampton, Virginia, and I'm going to a noon meeting, and it was, I expected lots of things. I have expectations about meetings. I walk in and I expect certain things. So a noon meeting is supposed to have like seven or eight people, maybe ten on a really good day, right? Walk into this noon meeting, it's like 50 people, and it's a busy meeting. People are up and down, and they're moving around, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And it's a hand-raising meeting. I've never been in a hand raising What? Who raises their fucking hands? I don't know. You just you blurt out when you want to talk, you know? That's where I was raised, you know? The person who talked the fastest got to share. <laughs> so this hand-raising thing, you know, the chair is like, okay, you know, Rob, and you, and you, and that's how, that's how, and then they shared, and then you go, and you, and you, and you. And so this guy raises his hand, and, uh, and, and obviously nobody knew him, because he didn't just have call the guy by name. I didn't know anybody, and so the guy, though, says, you know what, he says, I just got out of prison, and they told me to come to a meeting my first day out. I got out at 9 o'clock. I'm here after doing 27 years on the inside. Now, let me tell you what happened. There were a bunch of people all sitting around here, just like we are here. And the women got up and moved away. And the men came and they surrounded him while he was sharing. And they're patting him on the back. And they're writing their phone numbers down. And they're, and they're speaking to him. They're like, you share like that. You, you, you talk about it. Tell us what's going on, you know. And I don't know if the guy stayed clean. But I'm going to tell you, for that moment, he was not alone. He was not alone. He was surrounded by the love of the fellowship. And if he didn't say stay, he missed a damn good chance. You know, he had the chance to stay. And you know what? We build that chance. We build that chance ourselves. So, so you know, I want to talk about building our community. And we build a community like you build a house. And so just, just so that we can get to know each other, if you've got 20 years or more, would you stand up for a second? of our fellowship. That's right. They're the ones who begged to be able to have a meeting in a church that didn't want us. Yeah. They begged a judge to send their people to our fellowship. They begged for the prisons and the jails to let us bring in the message of recovery. They, they threw chairs, they, they toppled tables, they yelled at each other to make sure that we had a couple of guidelines and two spiritual principles to work by. <laughs> and we're here because they did what they did. So, if you got between two years and 20 years when you stand up, are the workhorses of Narcotics Anonymous. Also known as the farm mule. You are the, you are the people that keep the doors open every day. You make sure the farm is run the way it's supposed to. You're the carpenters. You put up the walls. You make sure that the that the, 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 the sheetrock is repaired. You make sure the plumbing's running in our fellowship. You're the ones that take a meeting into detox, even when you know that they are going to sleep through the whole motherfucker. <laughs> you know? I know. It was awesome. Um, you know, you're... you're, you're you're the folks that do this. You're the folks that drag your ass to region 
knowing that that guy that you just don't want to see is going to be there saying the same shit that he says last region and the region before and the region before that and you go anyway you know that's who you guys are and god bless you for doing the work you do it is it, it it's what keeps our little souls together if you don't have a black tea tag, stand up for me. My grandbabies, when they come here and they want to come in the door, they're not going to have a place to go. We're not going to have the people that, that, that need our message if you're not here. You have a huge responsibility to carry the message. I'm not always going to be here to carry the message, you know, but you're going to be here, and that is the future that you bring to our fellowship. So, I came here one time. I'm a one key tag girl. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the thing, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a story in the basic text that a gal from Japan wrote that says, uh, what makes me happy now? And she says, she doesn't know who is, who is the better NA member. The NA member that comes here one time and stays, or the NA member who comes back here time after time after time. There's a guy by the name of Donnie Ed, and he's in Omaha, Nebraska. And he came in here every, uh, in, and in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. And one time he was in a meeting and he shared, I haven't ever put together much time, but I've been here more than I haven't been here. And he says, and I keep coming back because I think maybe one day It'll all work out. And he's got 18 fucking years to live. Because one day he stayed. One day turned into two days, turned into four, turned into a year. And you know what? It can happen for anybody. But it's got to happen when it's going to happen. So we, uh, uh, we moved off of our boat this year. And we moved into a house. People say, why did you buy a house? And, I'm, and I tell them because my husband wanted a uh, garage and I wanted a sewing room and nobody would sell them to us all a cart. <laughs> they wanted to sell us the whole damn house and, you know, and so here we are, you know. And, and um, I've forgotten how awesome it is to be able to open the doors of my home to the fellowship and be able to let people come and go as they, as they please and be able to be that. Um, we, when I lived in Omaha, we used to call our, call our place the, the mothership because just the way it was, it was laid out, it was a two-story thing. We called it the mothership and people, people knew my house is never locked. My, my coffee pot is available, the coffee is right next to it. Come in, sit down, make a cup of coffee, somebody will be there eventually. You know, because it's a safe place to be. You know, if you're allergic to cats, you're fucked. But you know what? Because <laughs> my cats, my cats are the coolest people ever. You know, my cats are who I, who I want to be. I want to grow up to be one of my cats. Because you go into my house and my cats come over and go, we're cool, you will love us. You know, just pet us, we're going to be great. You know, I, I would love to be that person. I'm not. I'm really a, a pretty shy human. You know, I, I try to be really friendly out in the hall, but mostly I just want to go, just don't look at me, okay, I'm good. Because I just am, you know, it's weird. It, it's, a, it's an awkward place to be. But you know what, when I'm here and I've got you guys and I'm with you, it's easier, it's easier for me. So um, I came here in 1985. Um, my, um, 
So, I woke up in the middle of the night one night, and uh, I had been using for a really long time, and, and, and my husband had been using, and I had, uh, in, in, my, in my using, uh, I had twin daughters, and um, when they were five years old, I gave one of them to her father, because I thought that would get him off my back, and he wouldn't harass me about the other one, and maybe I'd be okay. And uh, some of the consequences of what the decisions we make when we're using is that daughter's 47 years old now and still doesn't speak to me. And that's her choice, and I honor her choice. Um, I hope that my granddaughters will come and look for me, that they'll want to know who I am, but if they don't, you know what I've had? I had an awesome opportunity to help you guys raise your kids. You know, I've been the grandma to a lot of kids in this fellowship, and I've watched kids grow up, and and and, and I've watched us bring kids in this in this room. You know, when when they're two days old, you know, and uh, Jake in Sioux City, we we passed him around two days old. We're passing him from from lap to lap to lap. You know, people would come up and say, "Who's baby?" I don't know. It's my turn to hold the baby. Yeah. <laughs> So Jake's about five years old, right? We raise our kids here, you know, and they know what we're doing better than we do. So Jake's about five years old, and he's got special crayons and special coloring book, you know. That, and, and in this particular meeting, at about quarter two, he passed the basket. And this new guy's running the meeting, and, um, and, and Jake's doing his coloring thing, you know, because that's, that's how he was raised. You're a good kid, you, you do your coloring thing, da da and the meeting goes on and on and on, and finally you see Jake, and he's putting his crayons away, and he's putting them in his little coloring book, and he walks up to the desk where the chair is at, and he puts his little hands on his hips, and he says, are you going to pass the basket, or what? <laughs> <laughs> because that's how we raise our kids here, you know? <laughs> raising our kids here, you know, Annie knows, and just because we raise our kids here doesn't mean that they're going to stay clean. But what our kids do is they have, they know where they can come. You know, there's never a question whether they're going to be okay and whether or not we're going to love them, because we always love them back, you know. Um, so I came here because I woke up one night in a house that was carpeted in, in, in trash and dirty clothes, where I was trying to raise kids, while I was barely sleeping, while I was never, ever, ever going to do the laundry or the dishes or anything. I got up in the middle of the night. My husband was not in the room with me. I went to look for him. And he was in the bed with my daughter, who was 12 at the time. And I stood in the hall and I shit myself. And I didn't know what to do. And right, wrong, or indifferent, I reached out and asked for help. And um, in Kalispell, Montana, at the time, it was a turn of the, um, it was a, uh, there was a big movement at the time. It was a, a program called Families Anonymous that had come out of California that dealt with sex offenders. And they put us into a family treatment program. And we were in that family treatment program for four years, and I stayed with him. In fact, I stayed with him for another 13 years after that, after we put a family back together again. And, and that was hard. It was hard in the fellowship because it was very well known how we got there. And so today, you know, what I, one of the things that I talk about is, you know, our third tradition tells us that the only requirement is to come in here and say, I want to be here. Do we include everyone? Are we inclusive no matter what we say? It doesn't matter what you did or who you are, but do we draw a line there? Are some people just not us? And we can't do that. We can't make that judgment. Everybody has a right to recover. There are people who can't, would come into the room, and I don't have to be their best friends out of here, but you know what unconditional love really is? It's respect. I have to respect your right to be here and your right to recover no matter who you are, where you came from, what you did, what you continue to do. 
your right to recover is paramount. And if I forget that, I'm fucked. You know, if I forget that, I'm not able to carry the message of recovery. And I'm not going to save your life because you have a right to be here. Everybody has a right to be here. You know, um, so I came into the recovery. We got through things. I asked this woman to sponsor me. I didn't know what, and I'd never heard of an anonymous anything. This is 1985. It wasn't on TV, it wasn't anywhere, it was in 1985. And they said, go to a meeting, ask someone to sponsor you. So there was this gal, she had red hair, she was smiling, she had a ear clean, I thought she was God. And, uh, and I said, will you sponsor me? And she got really excited about it. I was like, cool, I'm all that. <laughs> and, and we were making it up as we got, went along. Anybody who was here in those days, we made this shit up as we went along, you know? We really did. Oh, look, a step, we'll figure something out, you know? And so, but um, in, in Kalispell, Montana, they did uh, clean time once a month at, a, at the VA center. Um, and so she gathered me up uh, right after I got my 30 days and took me to this VA center. And she, and I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. I was just this good girl who, who went with her. You know, she'd say, we're going, and I'd say, okay. You know, because I didn't know. And, uh, and they, they said, you know, is there anybody who's going to give out a, uh, you know, a 30-day uh, key tag? And, and she stood up, and, and, and she walked up front, and she motioned to me, and I'm like, and she's like, and she said, this gal calls me all the time, and this gal's doing the things I ask her to do, and she's trying to change her life, and I'm so proud of her, and they clapped for me, and you fucking people had me then lock, stock, and barrel. You know? I was in. I was in. I was like, and how many days before I get the next one? Because, because it, was, it was cool. And this poor woman, so 1985, nobody will remember this, nobody will believe, but we didn't have caller ID. <laughs> you answered the phone, it was a crapshoot. <laughs> so, 2 o'clock in the morning, which, by the way, at 2.02 exactly is when Satan descends from the ceiling for me. My heart is beating out of my chest, and, and the whole world is coming to end 2.02. So 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm calling my sponsor. And of course she answered the phone because she doesn't know it's me. It's awesome. And, <laughs> and, and she said, and, you know, and, and I'm like, blah, 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 and the world is coming to an end, and, blah, 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 and the world is coming to an end. And she say things like, so are your dishes done? I'd be like, who? And she said, well, honey, why don't you do your dishes and talk to God and call me back when you're done? And you know, and, and three or so hours later, because it was me, and I hadn't seen the dishes or the sink in weeks. Um, you know, I sometimes I would call her back, sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes after three hours or whatever, I was sleepy enough to go back to sleep, or I was, you know, wound down, whatever it was. And, and, and then I would call her again, you know, a couple of nights later, and she'd say, is your laundry done? And I'd be like, fucking shit, you know? <laughs> Have you met me? You know, she'd say, well, why don't you go do the laundry? So I'm sharing this and how spiritual this woman is and how she brought me to find my higher power and my communication with this invisible, you know, thing. And... Um, and, and it occurs to me, this is how this woman slept. She would send me on a wild goose chase and she would cat nap. She would power nap through the night, you know, she'd be like, and I'm good for three hours, you know? <laughs> you know, by the grace of God, Jan is still, is still clean today. She's, you know, and, and, and she is a, a valued member of the fellowship, you know, and, and I love her. I love her dearly, you know, and she's, she's just a super cool lady, you know, who has been through a lot of stuff. She lost a son in recovery she didn't use. You know, she's lost a, a relationship in recovery she didn't use, you know, and, and, and she's been a, a, an inspiration to me. But 
her biggest inspiration to me was making sure that we have something for our newcomers to be able to do. Because she really did. She gave me the ability to change what my life was, you know. And eventually she would say, are your dishes done? And I'd be like, gotcha on that one. <laughs> dishes are done. And then she would say, you know, well, when was the last time that you cleaned out your junk drawer? And I'd be like, well, fuck you. So <laughs> there was always something, always something. But you know what, being here has given me seriously, seriously the best life ever. You know, I have been, I have, one of my bucket list things was to go to Cuba, and this last year I got a chance to go to Cuba, and I got a chance to go to a meeting in Cuba. And so we went on this, we're on this cruise thing, and, the, and when you get off the boat, the things they say to you, they give you very specific instructions. No water, no ice, no salad, okay? Do whatever you want to. No water, no ice, no salad. Because, you know, it isn't that, that their things aren't clean. It's just a lot of microorganisms and stuff that our stomachs aren't used to, you know? So fine. So um, I, had, I had this idea, I, I, I spent, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks, and I put a whole bunch of stuff in my backpack, and I smuggled it off of the boat, and, uh, and through customs, and, and I showed up with this guy I had made contact with, and he, and he took me to the meeting, and I got to go to an outside meeting, and before the meeting, I brought the ba the, my, my backpack, and we sat down, and, and I showed him what I had. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm a, um, if somebody comes to me and they come from world and they've got this backpack full of really cool shit that I've never seen before, you know, and you give it to me, I'm going to go, wow, this is awesome stuff, and maybe I would take it to my home group, and maybe I wouldn't, because it's cool shit. And so that's who I am, we're just being honest here. So the guy's going through stuff, and he's making seven piles. And I said to him, I said, Josephan, why are you making seven piles? And he says, because we have seven home groups and I want to make sure somebody, everybody has something. And at that moment, I wanted to be like on Star Trek, where you can transport shit from somewhere else and have like a million dollars worth of stuff there, because I felt so humbled. I felt so humbled by someone who was so grateful for the little backpack of crap that I brought. You know, and I got to go there, walk through this, up these stone steps, and I walk through this um, archway, and I walk into this open garden area, and there's all these chairs. There's probably 40 chairs there, and they had an N.A. poster, and, and these people are all sitting around. And, and I, I said, you know, when we planned this trip, I said, I'm going to learn how to speak Spanish. Not so much. Um, maybe next time. But... But, but there was a guy on this side of me and a girl on this side of me, and they whispered a little bit about what was going on, and, and there was a guy picking up his two years that night. And I watched these people. When we pass a medallion around, we go, cool medallion, here, you take it. Not these people. They prayed over it. They kissed it. They held it up to their higher power. They were so enthusiastic. And, and, and I was like, wow. Where's the enthusiasm? Where's my enthusiasm? Where's my gratitude for being here, you know? And so we all sat down and they walked around and they handed out a glass of water that came out of um, a contractor's, you know, cooler thing. And I went, hmm, no water, okay? Drinking the water, going down hard, it's gonna be ugly. You know, who knows what's gonna happen? So everybody got a glass of water and then they took a break and then they came back and they did this other really cool thing because we had a newcomer. And, and the chairperson called on people to tell the newcomer about things. They said, um, Sandy, will you tell the newcomer about the importance of meetings? You know, um, uh, Danielle, will you tell the newcomer about the importance of sponsorship? You know, and so, and, and it was really cool. I was like super enthused and super in, in, impressed with it. And then they, and then they passed out these little, little cups of coffee in these little funky cups, and I wanted a mug because it was really good. But they have these little tiny cups, and you know. So, but afterwards we took pictures, and they were so enthusiastic. And you know what? What an opportunity to see people who are so removed from the mainstream, people who can't order literature. 
from world. People who have to make do with what they've got. And there's 40 people at a home group and they close up and they are so excited about being clean. And I have to remember, where's my freaking gratitude? You know, where really am I today? So, I am so grateful to be here. You know, I, 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 I came to my first meeting, I stayed. I want to talk for two seconds about one fellowship, one family. I only come here. You know, what's the reason I want to come here? Because of the spiritual principle of fidelity. We talk about fidelity and we talk about, and we think about in a marriage or in a relationship, I'm going to practice fidelity. I practice fidelity here because I only have one message, and that's the life-saving message of Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> try to bring a whole bunch of other stuff in here, it's all going to get diluted and somebody might miss it and somebody might die. And that's my responsibility. You know, there's a, um, a line from my, 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 my favorite musical and I'm just going to tell you about it. And it really talks about where I'm at. So, it says, I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn. And we're led to those who would help us most to grow if we let them and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I know that I'm who I am today because of you. That's what I got. 